Hi, this is a presentation dealing with the challenges of developmentally appropriate curriculum and LGBTQ students in K-12 schools. First off, you know, les LGBTQ stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and the Q is both queer and often questioning. And for those of you who are not familiar with the phrase developmentally appropriate curriculum or DAP, it's a typically for early childhood um, education. So the idea is that children are taught in ways that are, quote, developmentally appropriate. However, and that idea has become part of our understanding of what is considered De, um, developmental, yes, but pedagogically appropriately sequenced. But then it is situated as connected to the age level and the presumed maturity or immaturity of a given child. But particularly, we're going to see how this notion of what it means to be developmentally appropriate you know, connects to our ideologies and constructions around children and childhood and specifically how that connects to creating LGBT inclusive classrooms at all levels. So the purpose of this presentation is to discuss those constructions of childhood and youth as it impacts PK through 12 school curricula. And we're going to differentiate the issues of sexuality and gender identity from discussions of sex or sex education. We'll also discuss age appropriateness and basis for school curricular changes, challenges. First off, it's important to understand that we use the term of sexual orientation, not sexual preference or lifestyle. I think that's become pretty commonplace, but nevertheless, it's important to say, is I may have a preference for a particular kind of ice cream, but one's, I, one's connections towards uh, you know, romantic affiliations and behavior and one's identity, all of those are very convoluted and powerful components. One's sexual orientation is a complex understanding of nature and nurture, yes, but it's largely wired into our brains. And the other important element is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. So gender identity refers to how one's brain is wired connected to gender and how it is connected or disconnected to one's physical body, genitalia, secondary care, uh, sex hormones and characteristics. The other important thing is to understand is that the word queer is okay if used by individual students, but it should not be used to describe a student unless you know that is how they themselves identify and have given you permission to do so. And it's also important to always go by the pronoun and the name a student gives you, even if the legal documents say still say something else. So that is a way of honoring the student. Because as we will talk about students who are in transition, a lot of them may be working, you know, maybe too young to have any other uh, to go through sex, um, <laughs> well, definitely too young for sex reorientation, but there's beta blockers that can help um, children who, at puberty, so before puberty, but children often know by the age of three and they um, connect to their own gender identity. And so <laughs> a child that might be in kindergarten might say, but I'm a boy, but they appear physically as a little girl. And so then they will start working on trying to connect is that, I, you know, it's like then they may want to take off any dresses. And it is important because some children have been known, to, you know, it's like who bi biological boys, for instance, have been known to try to castrate themselves uh, because their biology doesn't match who their brain says they are. So this is really important information. And uh, um, so I want to be also then begin with what words would you use to describe childhood? And typically I do this as, and as a whole group. And so then inviting typical, inviting participation. Some of the words that are most common would be innocent, delightful, fun. Um, sometimes we get some negatives like manipulative and mean. 
but mostly we get the ideas that uh, in association of childhood as joyful, playful, and innocent. So we get this image that helps represent that idea of innocent and playfulness. But it's important to understand that across different historical periods, children and childhood have been characterized in different ways. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, there was, a, you know, it was our economy was primarily organized through a labor cottage industry where children were simply valued for their contributions of labor. And so there was no dif differentiation or separation between a, the adult world and a child's world. That includes uh, sexual encounters might be happening and a child might be in the same space, seemed as normal, adult jokes around sex, and the child was not separated from any of that. Then as we moved into the 1800s, modernist psychology of the theory started um, perceiving and viewing, conceptualizing children as more incomplete beings. They were not yet developmentally complete. So in the modernist psychology, these theories significantly influenced this framing of children and childhood, emphasizing stages of development in which children are are in a state of becoming. And that would include particularly Erickson, Freud, and Piaget. Indeed, within this framework, the adult's greatest concern about children was how the children are to be were to be shaped and molded into the citizens that they would become. Quoting Plume 1971, the child had become an object of respect, a special creature with a different nature and different needs, which required separation compared to before in labor cottage and protection from the adult world. So that should begin to hear some of that which resonates into our current contemporary conceptualizations. This conceptualization then of innocent largely pulls from Rousseau's conception of children as pure, more natural-like and untainted and cor uncorrupted um, through, you know, then become corrupted through extended experience with the adult world. So we have had three major conceptions of miniature adults, incomplete beings, and more contemporary, that of innocent. So when we deal with issues of LGBT inclusion, particularly for young people, all of a sudden parents, teachers, other teachers and administrators say, what, you're teaching my child what? So one pervasive set of discourses around sexuality concerns children that children themselves are asexual beings. This idea derives from the broader construction of childhood in opposition to adulthood. Adulthood is construed as knowledgeable, as corrupt, while children are unaware, ignorant, and pure. From this perspective then, sexuality is acquired with maturity rather than considered an intrinsic characteristic of one's humanity. Despite documentation of healthy sexual behaviors in children and youth by psychiatric and medical communities, it remains largely unthinkable among the broader public for children to be aware of their own sexuality. So when you see the, oops, these, these images, what is your gut response? How do you feel? Do you feel good, bad? <laughs> Often people go, ah, isn't that cute? <laughs> we have you know, the I, early ideas of childhood romance. We get a play in the doctor kind of thing. And though all children on the one hand are constituted as asexual, these heterosexual behaviors are also considered cute and normal. As adults, we tend to hold these two incongruous normative concepts together simultaneously asexual and heterosexual. So the idea that children aren't sexual beings and yet demonstrations of heterosexual behavior that predict adult heterosexual lives are also deemed appropriate. But as mentioned, a binary between children and adults has been set up. Children as innocent and adults as knowledgeable and sexual beings. In schools and libraries, this association of adult with sexuality gets translated into sexuality equals sex. 
But however, we're challenging that. And so sexuality does not equal sex and I'm specifically referring to sexual intercourse. Even descriptions of a sexual orientation then leads many adults to presumptions of sex. However, as mentioned before, we know that sexuality and human physiology are interchangeable. They are part of our human character humanity and characteristics. So some things you might not know is that um, medical communities have documented that in utero, penile erections are a bit occur have, been, um, a have occurred and documented as early as the 17th week of fetal development. And here's some common sexual behaviors that are normative between ages two and six. Touching a mother's breast, playing doctor, and up to 75% of children in this age group touching their own genitals, looking at others when nude, and touching with their genitals is often, uh, as, uh, while less common, is considered a very uh, soothing response as sucking one's thumb. Sucking one's thumb is much, much, uh, publicly much more common and socially acceptable than touching one's genitals. However, these behaviors peak at age five uh, in the public because then all of a sudden children begin understanding the difference between public and private spheres, especially if they start moving into kindergarten. So then the idea of what can happen at home and what can happen in public spaces becomes really important. So then understanding gender and sexuality in young children including gender identities, includes the discomfort associated with violating presumed gender boundaries are learned early in life. By age three, children commonly tease other gender non-compliant children by intentionally mislabeling them. And this is not about, you know, it's like you, they might be called gay or, you know, it's like they may tease a girl for playing with boys and um, may use the word dyke even but that's not about homophobia at this early stage, but they may be using those words because they are trying to um, police, even as young children, what is considered normal and normal and normative. And so then they will tease, taunt, and even bully uh, young children, but it's about more about their understandings of gender than sexuality. So you may or may not be familiar with a book from Being Jazz. And um, Jazz is a transgender uh, young adult now, but has a um, autobiographical text for teens and now a picture book for young people. And she argued, asserts, the more I learned, the more I started to verbalize my feelings. Whenever my mom or dad would compliment me by saying something like good boy, I'd immediately correct them. No, good girl. She understood herself to be a girl, even though she physiologically presented as a boy. And when she was about two years old, I had what I now refer to as my good fairy dream. I ran downstairs and found my mother sitting in our living room. When is the good fairy going to come with her magic wand? The who? The good fairy who will turn my penis into a vagina. Note the um, biologically appropriate term, use of terms. And that's also important is that in order to create a healthy respect for our bodies among children is using the correct terminology is also very important. So LGBT youth and minority culture groups. So it is important to under think about that LGBT typically are reared by heterosexual and cisgendered parents, meaning that not transgender. So their biology and their gender match. That refers to cisgender. Unlike, and they are differently segregated than other minority cultural groups as not welcomed in the cultural community from the birth. So most marginalized and disenfranchised groups in the United States by race and ethnicity are born to that same ethnicity. So many black children are born to black parents. We have then the issue of transracial or transnational um, adoptions. And so then they become reared with parents that don't necessarily look like them. 
setting that aside, most uh, the majority are born into families that by, that physically look like them. However, LGBT youth, you know, so children who be you know understand gradually or early because um, that happens at different ages to be um, gay, lesbian, bisexual are typically born to heterosexual parents. So if that's the case, so all of a sudden there becomes a distance. So there's not a natural community to support them from birth as there typically is for other minority cultural groups. So then it takes additional work because that community group is not inherently there. So that gets us, brings us to the concept of development appropriate, which informs learning and educational psychology from K, PK through 12, and particularly highlighted by Piaget and Erickson. And so then it has become part of our understanding and assumptions that underlie our standard-based alignment. So then when we are making considerations for K-12 curriculum, we think, what is the development appropriate content for X? So this notion of development appropriate curriculum informs education through PK-12 schooling. States who have adopted the Common Core state standards or other similar set of standards all do so based upon a concept of development progressive curricula. This notion derives from the concept of children and youth as incomplete beings that develop in predictable stages and need instruction that matches that stage development and then also need to be properly shaped and molded to be effective adults. From these conceptions of childhood that we hold so forcefully, despite scientific and frequently personal evidence to the contrary, it becomes developmentally inappropriate to make any mention or allusion to sexuality or sexual orientation. Again, despite the presumption of heterosexuality, which goes on Mars. We can't talk about that. Our students aren't ready for such content. Gender identity, one would think, which should be easier to discuss then because everyone has a gender, right? But what I haven't gotten into here for lack of time yet is how presumptions of heterosexuality are intricately tied to presumptions of normative gender expression. My re own research in LGBT young adult literature reiterates this notion time and time again. If one defies gender norms, their sexuality is challenged. If one transgresses sexual identity norms, their gender is questioned. Thus, I am arguing from a theoretical and research base that to include topics or texts that bring up LGBTQ issues is development appropriate. We all have a sexuality. We all have a gender identity. Both are part of being human and neither just happen during and after puberty. So we have this, um, get, so following the notion of development appropriate practice, we have this notion of not appropriate for age group. And so the American Library Association continues a list of rationales for the most challenged books. And that are the, the most challenged book list involves different kinds of controversial materials. And the two reasons based on sociodemographics, race and sexuality, racial concerns prompted more challenges than homosexuality. But texts dealing with homosexuality, LGBTQ issues, were more likely to be banned from the curriculum and our library than those dealing with race. So race is more often challenged but those with LGBT are more likely censored. So um, Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network is Leeson. So they note that 63 and a half percent, they can regularly do a climate survey of LGBT students. So they are the ones that, so they get their voices on how schools are doing. So this is from them and they do it fairly regularly. So of one of the latest reports, 63.5% of the students surveyed, LGBT specifically students surveyed, so over 10,000 students between ages of 13 and 21, reported an incident said that school staff did nothing in response to or told the student to ignore it. So when told, when it reported an incident, the school staff did nothing in response or told the student to ignore it. 
So uh, part of the problem with this is that there might have been some response that the students didn't know. And so it perceived as nothing or really was nothing. So I, I want to um, try to balance it out and recognize um, and that 66 and a half, uh, little, uh, 60, you know, little over 66% of the LGBT students reported personally experiencing um, LGBT policies, discriminatory policy practices at school, and almost three fourths of them said other students had experienced these discriminatory policies and practices at school as well. So they are experiencing discriminatory practices. They are experiencing um, bullying, harassment, and they're not experiencing a lot of teacher response. And part of the teacher lack of teacher response is that one, teachers may not know what to do and how to respond, or historically has been that they thought the students deserved it. So I want you to, um, I'm gonna make sure I reference the handout um, bullying policies by ISBE and Gleason's models, model school comprehensive anti-bullying policy. And I would encourage you to look and see if what note, differences that you might notice. But specifically ISBE focuses on effects or outcomes, but not people. That should be good, right? Because specific identity markers are not mentioned. That should make the policy more inclusive, right? It's like the idea of colorblindness. It fails to recognize specific differences that make students more likely to be targets. So want to bring a few uh, include books. So we have um, the, and the first three, we have more you know, some uh, pow, great picture books, more Smickle White in the Tangerine Dress in Our Mother's House, Tango Makes Three. Uh, we have three, um, middle grades text. I need to update these. <laughs> and this fits totally Joe and better Nate than ever, which is absolutely just fabulously fun. And then we have a number of different uh, young adult texts. And if of these, oh, they're also good. But Aristotle and Dante and Discover the Secrets of the Universe, such beautiful language in it. Uh, Every day is fabulous because the main character doesn't actually have a corporeal body and is known as A. 50 um, Beautiful Music for Ugly Children deals with transgender issues. We contain multitudes. <laughs> it's self-explanatory. History is all you left me, you know, a story uh, of loss. And 57 Bus actually of all of these is because the other five are actually novels. 57 Buffs reads like a novel, but it's actually an informational text that actually begins some of the newer uh, context of intersectionality with a non-gender conforming individual and um, a young black man and their <laughs> how their lives overlap for seven minutes and what happens in those seven minutes. But I would also uh, make, the lack of intersectionality is changing. There is increase of it, but it is still limited. But particularly I want to highlight is that some, and paying attention to is, I mentioned talk, you know, referenced jazz. And so these are images, I am jazz, and that's, she has a podcast and YouTube channel and just a major social uh, influencer that way. So being jazz, my life as a transgender teen. And then we have the picture book that, but what I want, so what has always struck me is the skin tones. Notice how jazz in this, in the picture book looks much whiter than her darker skinned um, as in actuality. So, you know, in the other pictures, the rosy cheeks, you know, but it's not, you know, in her actual pictures isn't, you know, there's a little bit of pink, but it's more brownish. So rather, so she doesn't look white because she's not, you know, she, she's biracial um, in here, but she doesn't look biracial in the picture book. So these are file considerations that we need to always be looking at. So 
what can I say to our school's parents? First and foremost, highlighting the need to be for inclusive and welcoming environments and clarifying how incorporations of text with LGBT characters and conflicts connects to your district's broader stances on social justice. And I would also you know, encourage you to reference the Common Core State Standards and others, uh, and particularly our new, new ones with the culturally responsive teaching and learning standards that while are meant for teacher education can also are relevant for K-12. So those that text and curriculum addresses and how the text content fits from the broader curriculum. So is, you know, if we have a strong rationale and we're able to argue that, then that goes a long way. And underscoring that the text and curriculum is not teaching about sex or sex of education, but about living in the world, about complexity, but particularly if there's common themes that are connected to other texts so that it is not shown to be about this, but it is about this and more. 